All right, the children will now depart with Lisa to their class. As they do, let's begin our time in prayer. God, we can't imagine ever not needing you, ever feeling like we don't need you, Lord. We know that every breath that we breathe, every beat of our heart, Lord, is ordained and allowed by you. So, God, we confess as a congregation that we need you. We cannot live without you, Father. It is foolish to try. It is foolish to boast about tomorrow when we don't know if tomorrow will come. It is foolish, Lord, but we do it. And we ask you, Father, for your forgiveness. So, Lord, would you uh, refine us today, refine us this morning, and uh, change us, Father, from who we are to more perfectly into the image of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise God. Good to have uh, Carl back for Bible Bag. Um, in fact, Laura did an outstanding job as well uh, with Bible Bag. Uh, but happy to have uh, Nunish's back for sure. And thank you, Dick and Patton, for choosing that worship for us. All right. So we have two more lessons in James. And I hope you guys have uh, gained something from uh, the book of James. It's a very practical book. We talked about that, right? It's not really concerned with theology so much as it's concerned with boots on the ground. How do you live this thing out? And I, uh, I love that third song that sung about uh, n n now to live. Here are our offerings, Lord, but now to live. We put it into practice. And that's what James is uh, most concerned with in his letter. Uh, if you've ever read James for the first time, you're like, ouch, man, that hurts. He's like very direct. He's a, you know, one, one liners left and right, kind of sucker punching us because uh, he's just very direct and very straight to the point. And that's just how James reads. Um, so, all right, so we're going to get into chapter four and into chapter five today. Really, uh, again, the, the chapter breaks were not original to the original text because really I think 413 through 56 could kind of go together. And you'll see that as we flesh that out. But I want to talk about three things today from this passage that uh, are in your bulletin. Number one, I'll talk about the problem with boasting. Secondly, I want to talk about the absurdity of boasting. And then thirdly, the cure for boasting. So let's talk about the problem with boasting, first of all. So let's look at verse 13, chapter 4, verse 13. He says, come now. You who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. All right, so the phrase come now uh, is an ancient rebuke statement. And James actually uses it twice. Um, verse 13 and verse chapter 5. So verse 13 says, come now you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Come now, you rich. All right? So this is an ancient uh, phrase of rebuke, as if James is saying, Are you serious? <laughs> you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city and make a profit? And what James is rebuking, folks, is a very particular thing that they were doing. And what it looks like James is rebuking at first, if you, uh, upon first glance, is it seems like he's rebuking strategic business planning. It sounds like he's saying, all you businessmen who map out your one, three, and five-year plans are foolish. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay? Uh, but this can't be actually what James is rebuking because we know other places in the Bible that actually uh, calls us foolish if we don't plan. So, for example, uh, Jesus said, for which of you intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Lest, after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish, uh, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Why? Because he didn't plan. Okay. Or Solomon, he gave uh, this rebuke many times in the Proverbs. He would say, you sluggard, you sit on, the, on your haunches all day long and watch YouTube. Okay, <laughs> all day long, you know, some of us do that, but um, he says, look at the ant. The ant plans 
He stores up food so that when the, the barren season comes, there's enough food for all. So James is not rebuking uh, those who plan. And re- but re- verse 16 is really the key. James says, but now you boast in your arrogance, and all your boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. So, let's t- so, so what he's condemning, folks, is boasting. Okay, now let's talk about boasting for a minute because it may be a little bit different than we typically think about boasting. Anyone play uh, basketball in either middle school or high school? Okay. Uh, I played uh, basketball in middle school. Probably shouldn't have, but I did. I wasn't very good at it. Uh, one thing I remember about middle school basketball, you know, middle of the winter, uh, you know, you're stuck in a big g- gymnasium. And uh, one thing I remember is uh, the, the, the music that we would play, particularly on home games, the music we would play uh, on, uh, at, at our home games. And one thing I remember is, uh, well, one song in particular. We, we, so we choose music that pumps us up, right? Uh, and one song I remember in particular was the song uh, from the Queen's song, We Will Rock You, right? Uh, buddy, you're a young man, hard man, shouting in the street, going to take on the world someday. You got blood on your face, your big disgrace, waving your banner all over the place, all right? So the, and the chorus sings, we will, we will rock you, right? And so that song, folks, is a boast, right? Uh, the song was meant to, A, threaten the other team with what we're going to do to you, but also pump us up that uh, we would actually have the power to do it, which we never did. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you're in the military, or no, if you're familiar with military history, uh, you probably know that one of the things that army generals do or would do to pump up their men so that they would confidently run into battle and risk death was to chant a boast before charging in. So they'd say something like, this is our land, and today you will bow at our feet and serve us. It's a boast, right? Uh, or Goliath. Remember Goliath? He gave a boast to David before they fought. He said, David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the fields. Right? That's a boast. That's what a boast is. Okay? Um, uh, and and it's, it's meant to intimidate and to instill confidence in the one who gives the boast. So the, the, uh, the sin that James is rebuking in this section is not the sin of planning, but the sin of boasting, okay? The sin of saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to this place, do this thing. After you, we'll come back. Watch out, because here we come, okay? And, uh, and the culprits of this spirit of boasting were the merchants, in fact, chapter 4, James takes a shot at uh, the spirit of boasting in these merchants. And in chapter 5, James takes a shot at what the spirit of boasting led these merchants to do in practice. It said they held back wages from their workers. They lived in luxury and plenty. They condemned and murdered their dust seemingly just to make a buck. Okay, Folks, when we make a boast... You, you take something you have, however big or small, and you wield it like a sword. Let me say that again. When we boast, we take something we have, and we wield it like a sword. You say, this is mine, I can do what I want with it, and I'm going to do what I want with it. Boasting grabs what we have and inevitably weaponizes it because you say to yourself, this is mine, I earned it, I worked hard for it, and under your breath you're thinking, and don't you dare touch it or I'll beat you. (laughs) You weaponize it, okay? And so if you run your business, for example, from a boast, if you run your your business from uh, the the boastful boastful illusion that This is my business. I put blood, sweat, and tears into it. I made it what it is today. If that's how you run your business, you will be ready to fight anyone who threatens to injure what you have built, and you'll probably mistreat your employees. Why? Because they're a threat to you, right? A boast is intended to pump myself up for what I have done and at the same time intimidate you from any thought you might have of taking what's mine. And this is exactly what happened with the merchants. They believed they built their business empires on their own strategy and ingenuity, 
they planned, okay? They played the stock market just right. They made the right decisions at the right time. And as a result, they made a boast in the heart that said, ain't no employee of mine going to mess up what I have built. And so what they do? They held back wages and became controlling, stingy bosses. Their leadership philosophy was give your employees too much freedom and they'll backstab you and take what's yours. As a result, they became abusive, right? So folks, when you make a boast, you take something you have and you wield it like a sword. And the Bible says all such boasting is evil. Now, I want you to see something here. Uh, boasting in this regard is not primarily a problem of riches or of merchants or of private business, okay? Uh, but, uh, but actually, uh, there are entire worldviews today that say it is a result of riches or corporate America. So for example, and, and so they say this, right? They say, let's take away everyone's money, because that's the problem, and give it to the government Let's let the government disperse the money equally among everyone so we're all middle class, uh, and, uh, and, and this will solve our problem, okay? But uh, uh, th th this is what communist nations believe, right? Th but this is an elementary school uh, 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 understanding of the problem because here's the thing. It is absolutely possible, folks, to be dirt poor <laughs> and still be guilty of the evil of boasting that James speaks of. Absolutely possible. So now that's rarer, right? Because usually the less you have, the less you have to boast of. The more you have, the more you have to boast of. But it's possible. Uh, it's not a problem of being rich. Um, but James is speaking to the rich because they're the culprits. So, but, so boasting, though, for the rich and boasting for the poor look different. I want you to think about this, because we see this, both of these in our society, okay? Let's talk about boasting for the rich. So the rich uh, usually believe in an undetermined universe. What does that mean? The rich believe everything is about personal choice, okay? The rich believe that uh, y your life becomes what you make of it. It's all about personal choice. You work hard, you do the right things, and you'll succeed. As a result, they tend to look at anyone who is not achieving as simply reaping the consequence of their own choices. Consequently, they tend to have a lack of compassion on people. In fact, they probably would not show up at Isaiah 61 to serve during the week because they think, well, you guys are, are where you're at because of your uh, bad decisions. Okay? So, and, 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 and honestly, the Republicans, more than the Democrats, fall on this side of the coin. So the rich believe the world is undetermined. Your life is what you make of it. And these are the people who are generally most guilty of sp the specific things James was addressing in chapters 4 and 5. They planned and planned and planned, and with uber confidence, they thought their plans would succeed, and they make plans without God. Okay? Now, but now, bo so that's what boasting for the rich sounds like. Boasting for the poor sounds a little different, but it's still boasting. Listen to it. The poor often believe the world is determined. They, they believe you are the product of the environment that you had no choice in. They believe people get where they get because of privileged opportunities rather than personal choice. So you inherited good genes, or uh, you, 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 you were given a good start. Or you were born white, right? Incid yeah, yeah. Incidentally, you know, Democrats, we know, would side more to this side. The mental health field today has in a large way attached to this worldview, often convincing people that you're stuck with your disease or disorder and you can't change, okay? Or uh, uh, you, uh, you're just forever stuck there. And as a result, boasting for the poor often sounds like all you rich people suck, uh, you think you had something to do with where you're at, but the truth is you were born to privilege, and I was not. Their boasting is seen in their resentment, prejudice, and entitled feelings toward anyone who has more than them. You were given more, therefore you ought to give to me. See that? Boasting just a little different, right? Let me tell you, folks, the Bible is not as narrow-minded 
as both of these views. The Bible is not as naive as karma. You do good, you get good. You know, you know what? Sometimes you do good, you get bad. Sometimes you do bad, you get good. We see that, don't we? And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, first of all, that you have no control over what happens tomorrow. Okay? The Bible says, do you really think you can plan out your future through your own personal decisions? Do you really think your life is simply a result of your own personal choices? Folks, if you're financially uh, successful today, that is not just a result of your wise financial investments. You know why? You know, COVID taught us this. Because if it were not for a plethora of other global criteria happening in the, in the background every day of which you have no influence or personal control, your financial decisions may have produced nothing at all or even a loss. Right? So the idea that your life is completely undetermined and that your personal choice is the only real player in your future is simply foolish. But secondly, the Bible says this. It says, don't you dare think that just because you weren't born to privilege, that your life is determined to stay in unprivilege. The Bible says you have personal decisions to make every day that God can either bless or not bless, right? The Bible says you may have been born to unprivilege. You may have been born with a disorder. You may have been born with a sexual attraction to people of the same sex. You may have been born Mexican, not white American. But don't you dare think that God is so small that he cannot reverse the, cor the, the, uh, the course of your determinedness. Right? So, God, folks, uh, God is not so small that he cannot lift you above your starting point and bring you to privilege, right? So do you see this? Do you see that the boasting James speaks of here is not a monetary matter? It's a human heart matter, okay? And so uh, boasting, again, uh, takes what we have and weaponizes it. It either says, this is mine, I earned it, don't you dare touch it, or I'll break your arm. <laughs> or it says, I'm underprivileged, you have a responsibility to serve me. Still boasting. Okay? And both of these narrow, uh, are narrow-minded and constitute the sin of boasting in the Bible. So that's the first thing we see, the problem with boasting. The second thing is this, the, the absurdity of boasting. So, uh, and, 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 and there are two absurdities that James mentions in this section. So the first is found in verse 14. Uh, why, you don't, even know, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Anybody ever seen the uh, old Dennis the Menace movie released in 1993? Okay. Uh, there, there's this scene I like uh, to YouTube every once in a while just to laugh. My kids catch me on it. And it's a scene of Dennis tying up the robber in order to show the robber how to tie up a five-year-old. Remember that? And when the robber's all tied up by Dennis the Menace, the five-year-old, uh, and, 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 and he gets innocently abused by Dennis afterwards because he's all tied up, he says to Dennis, because he's so frustrated, he's like, I'm going to kill you, kid. <laughs> And five-year-old Dennis, unfazed, and not realizing this is, an actually, it is actually a robber, uh, has this perfect reply. He says, how? You can't even move. <laughs> okay. Well, James voices the absurdity of boasting in verse 14 by saying to the wealthy merchants, how? You can't even move. You can't make tomorrow come. You're going to do what in a year? You can't make your heart beat another moment. You, your life is just a mist, and you are, and, and you are so confident you're going to do, you're going to go where next month, right? You can almost hear uh, verse 14 dripping with ridiculousness, <laughs> okay? And the problem, again, folks, is not that they're planning. The problem is that they are planning with one crucial ingredient excluded, and the ingredient is found in verse 15. If it's the Lord's will we will live and do this or that, right? The ingredient they left out of the equation was the fact that only God has the power to determine their future. He alone what des decides what will succeed and what will not succeed. So that's the first absurdity that James, the second one is this, 
and it's found in, in chapter 5, verse 2. He says, your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Right? So the, the second absurdity of boasting is seen in what it does to us. Uh, and James says that boasting erodes our life. Now, obviously, he's speaking uh, metaphorically here he, because their garments probably were not literally moth-eaten, okay? Uh, James is talking about what their boasting, what, what our boasting does to our insides. Verse 3 says, your gold and silver, silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire, okay? So the fruit of this absurd boasting was not just the ex uh, exploitation of their laborers, but also the deterioration of their souls. And I want you to see how this happens. Okay? A person who has this boastful, uh, arrogant mentality in one area of life um, will find that it erodes and corrupts all areas of life. Like, this boasting will spread like cancer in your life. Remember the story of a successful businessman whose boasting caused him to weaponize, okay? He, he was hard on his employees, and he brought this same uh, hard mentality home, expecting his wife and children to react to his controlling ways in the same way his employees did, right? And over time, he found that his boasting was eroding his relationships, the more his relationships eroded, the more his funds dried up, okay? Divorce court, attorney's fees, child support, right? If you have arrogance and boasting in one area of your life, it will dissolve into all areas of your life and produce corrosion, okay? And, of course, ultimately this boasting uh, keeps you from the Lord uh, and results in sort of the, in the eternal corrosion of your soul, right? So this, folks, is the absurdity of boasting. It's ridiculous because what we boast about, we don't actually have the power to bring to pass. And secondly, this boasting erodes our whole life, even if it begins in a certain area of your life. Does that make sense? So, okay, so that's the problem with boasting, the absurdity of boasting. Now let, let's close with the cure for boasting. Um, my daughter, Michaela is about to launch off to college in the fall and no longer has to submit to dad's children illustrations, <laughs> okay? Uh, and she's going to the same college that uh, Marcy and I went to. And uh, so my freshman year of college, at that college, I remember was the time when my boasting uh, began to get cured, okay? And, I, and you know, so I was popular in high school, I was athletic, I was a captain of my sports teams. I was a hot ticket, and Marcy picked me up. Uh, actually, actually, I picked her up. That's what it was. <laughs> but then came college, and I thought for a little bit I'd try out for the college Division II football team. And the first thing that discouraged me from doing that was my first roommate. We were roommates for, for like three days. Okay? Uh, this gentleman was on the football team. He was a black guy, six foot seven, 270 pounds from Alabama or somewhere. Uh, I didn't know him from Adam. Uh, I didn't have a roommate, so the college chose a roommate for me. Say, hey, these guys, looks like they have something common. Let's put them together, right? <laughs> and the first time I saw him, literally walking into my dorm room with two suitcases off the airplane. The second I saw him, I said to myself, this guy could probably take my entire high school team by himself. <laughs> Not to mention, I grew up in rural New Hampshire and hadn't talked to a black person but twice my entire life, and this mammoth of a man was now sleeping in the bed five feet away from me. And so <laughs> here's what began to happen in college for me. I began to run into people who could boast more about themselves than I could about myself. And the first thing this did to me was it brewed envy, right? Right? Uh, I was no longer the hot ticket. I was unknown to everyone on campus, and I so much wanted to be known as every college student wants to be known, right? But then something much more positive began to happen to me at the same time that I was feeling jealousy. I began to learn more about this Jesus who could boast of so much more than my roommate could, <laughs> right? And I learned that in the presence of Jesus, 
even though he was a mammoth of a man, I never felt less than, although I was less than. With Jesus, I found that the bigger he became in my understanding, the fuller I became as a person. With Jesus as my roommate, I found that he could fill the room with his mammothness, and somehow I was not afraid or insecure or made to feel inferior. The more Jesus filled the room of my heart, the more peace I felt. Or say another way, as Jesus became more, my boasting became less. Right? You want a cure for boasting? Stop comparing yourself to other people whom you have some leg up on and start fixating on Jesus. Right? So can we do that for a moment? Can we, can we just fixate on Jesus as we close? Jesus had the authority to determine everything. Right? He set the planets in orbit. He determined the seasons. He determined where all the peoples of the earth would live. And Jesus was so desirous for a relationship with rebellious humanity that he determined from the foundation of the world to enter the world and save it. He determined when he would come. He determined how long he would stay. He determined where he would live. He determined how he would die. From the moment Jesus was born in Mary's womb, Jesus' life was determined. But his life was determined so that ultimately your future would not have to be. Jesus determined to die so that you could choose to live through him. Jesus determined to suffer so that you could make the choice to follow Christ and never suffer again, right? Jesus determined to take your sins upon his shoulders so that you could walk free and be set free from all the things about yourself you thought were determined, right? Jesus determined to come for you so that you could see that nothing about yourself and your life is really determined. Right? Jesus wants to enter your life and change the things, folks, that you cannot. Jesus wants to enter your world to set you free from the things the world says you're stuck with. But another thing the mammoth man of Jesus does is this. He takes all the bad choices you have made that you feel have determined your future, and he turns them for God. Does he not? He takes all the decisions you knew you should not have made, and he wants to dance with you in such a way as to make it look like that was part of the dance routine. Right? Jesus wants to take every proud word of boasting you ever said and use your voice to boast about him. Right? He wants you to become less so that he can become more in you. He wants your pride to run dry so his love can fill you. He wants you to drop your grandiose plans for your future that you so boastfully believe you can reach, and he wants to give you a plan that's actually a, a little bit good. <laughs> right? he, wants to, he wants you to see that whatever dreams and plans you had for yourself and that, that you so confidently thought you could reach are not worth the paper you wrote them on. Because he's got a better plan for you. But if you want his perfect plan for your life, you need to be willing to boast only in him. You must be willing to lose yourself in him. You must be, this is the different way of fighting that song talked about, right? You must be willing to give up the reins of your life and let him drive. You must finally come to see that if you really want to live, you must first die. Die to your desires, die to your plans. Die to your own will, and you must say, Lord, put me to death so that you can live in me. Have you boasted about your plans and failed to include the one who alone has the power to prosper your plans? Have you weaponized what God has given you because you thought it was yours? You thought you earned it. You thought it was yours to keep and protect, and as a result, you mistreated the people in your care, right? Have you failed over the years to temper your grandiose plans with, if the Lord wills, I will do this or that, right? D maybe you need to repent of this this morning. Do you need to begin to run your business under new plans and a new owner? Not you, but Jesus, right? What direction would you take as a merchant if you began any plan with, what would Jesus do and if the Lord wills? On the other hand, have you boasted that others ought to serve you because you were born underprivileged? 
has that boasting turned into entitlement and prejudice toward people who have more than you? Are you filled with jealousy and find it very difficult to be happy for people who have more because you feel like you should have more yourself? You failed to make choices. Have you failed to make choices that God would make because you believed that your life was determined? Do you see now, folks, that it's not? Okay. Is it time today to hand over the keys of your life and say, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Jesus, take the car. Take the whole bus and drive it because I stink at this. <laughs> right? And I have nothing to boast about. Right? Is it time to finally make Jesus your roommate? who forevermore can fill your room with him and find that as he does, you become more and more complete. And as he fills the room of your heart more and more, the more secure you feel in any and every situation, and you don't need to boast about anything. So I wonder for you personally, what's, a, what's your next step of faith this morning? We're going to surround communion in just a second, but uh, maybe you've been boasting about me. Maybe you thought you got to where you did on your own. Okay, that's boasting. Maybe you need to temper that and say, Lord, I am what I am because of you. Maybe you need to repent of boasting. Maybe you need to repent of entitlement, thinking that well, why were they born to privilege and I was not? I guess I'm forever stuck here. Maybe you need to repent of that. You're not forever stuck anywhere. Not with Jesus on your side. Okay. What do you need to, what's your next step? Maybe your next step of faith is just to confess, Lord, take, take my wheel. I give up. Here's my life. We're ready to go. Let's confess that belief. Let's repent of uh, your arrogance and let's be baptized and let's begin the journey. Maybe that's your next step. Let's do that. Okay, Plenty of water around here. Right there, four lakes. We'll find some. What is your next step of faith? Let's stand. The music's going to play. If there's something you need to do, please uh, respond. I'll be standing over here to the right. Maureen will be over here to the left or go to someone here that you trust. Let's stand and commune together.